Okay, um, as I say, today we are, we're going to be focusing on surface, surface, surface and stewardship, surface and stewardship. <laughs> then no, no class next week, the following week we will get together and have a conclusion on practicing the disciplines. And as I say, I may fill in a few of the blanks because you, know, you probably noticed in the Whitney and in uh, Foster. Uh, Foster, they don't have exactly the same list of what they call spiritual disciplines. In fact, the, the list of what could be considered spiritual disciplines by some people's uh, accounting, it, it gets a little ridiculous. I mean, some people, uh, eating is a spiritual discipline. I don't know. That it's, and and I, don't go, I don't go for that. I, I, yes, we do all things unto the Lord. But in terms of growing closer to, to Jesus, in terms of growth and godliness, pursuit of godliness, um, I think there's a limit there. I think both what Whitney and uh, Foster offer, and, and a few others, like... Uh, Dallas Willard, I've mentioned, his Spirit of the Disciplines, I think they're very good. There are some others, I've had some other materials that I feel like they go way, way too far in terms of what they list. I may fill in a couple of the blanks, though, on some critical areas on the last class two weeks from today, and then the, the last hour two weeks from today, we will have the final exam. Today we will talk about uh, service and stewardship. And I will tell you that uh, I'm going to talk about, about service in a couple of ways. First, I want to talk about Christian service as sort of a general uh, aspect of the Christian life. Um, how every Christian is called and equipped to acts of service. So we'll start with that. Then afterwards, I'm going to come back, circle back around, and talk about specifically service as a spiritual discipline. Do you understand that difference? That, that all Christians, even those who are not aware or focused on trying to develop spiritual disciplines, as a way to become more like Jesus, as a way to pursue greater godliness in your life. We're all, if we are believers in Jesus Christ, called to serve. And then I believe there is sort of a next level of us understanding service, where we really do see that as a way for us spiritually to become more like Jesus. Not just that that's an obligation in our Christian life, but that it is something that we practice in a very kind of focused and intentional way in order to be closer to the Lord, to be more like Jesus. And then I'm going to talk about stewardship. Uh, stewardship really, the reason these two relate together, stewardship really is a specialized aspect of service, I believe. And so we'll talk about it in that regard. And it kind of, uh, we'll talk about how I believe that stewardship touches on the thing in our Western culture which makes us least spiritual. And that is our relationship with money and material objects. Some of you who attend our church have heard me preach on these things, but I'm going to get into some of that today. Okay? Um, let me start by saying, what is Christian service? The definition I would offer is that Christian service means to reflect the love of God by doing the work of God. That should be a capital G. Um, there's no theological intent behind that. I just made a mistake. It's the work of God, capital G, with a willing heart and especially in caring for the needs of others. I say especially because there's an extent to which Christian service can also be... Uh, addressed by acts of discipline in prayer, acts of discipline in, you know, those are kinds of service that we commit to God. But particularly, we're talking about caring for the needs of others as a way of reflecting God's love and doing His work with a willing heart. Okay? Um, Billy Graham has said, the highest form of worship is the worship of unselfish Christian service. The most eloquent prayer is the prayer through hands that heal and bless. This gets at what we mean when we talk about Christian service really as a, a spiritual discipline, that um, it is a kind of worship. It is, a, it, as Billy Graham has identified it, okay? As always, you will, you will stop me if you have questions. Can you elaborate on uh, Billy Graham's last sentence? Mm -hmm. The most eloquent <laughs> prayer, prayer is the prayer through hands that heal and bless. If we do it as unto the Lord, then there really is a prayerful aspect to us serving others. Now, I'm going to talk about the fact that as a spiritual discipline, uh, part of it is we do service as unto Christ directly. When Jesus said, as much as you've done unto the least of these, you've done it unto me, it really does mean when we care for others and we do it as unto Christ, in the name of Christ, it really is an act of worship and in that way an act of prayer. Okay? Not trying to be too... New age. I don't think Billy Graham was being new agey here, you know, for instance. Uh, I think he was being very practical. That it really is a kind of worship and a kind of prayer when we serve others as unto the Lord and uh, uh, in the name of the Lord. All right? 
The first aspect I would, I would focus on is the fact that as Christians, and this is why I've divided up this sort of general understanding of Christian service and then the Christian service as a spiritual discipline. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you are a part of the body of Christ, then you um, are called to serve. That's true for every Christian. As part of the body, we are not only called to serve, but we are given special ability to serve. We are equipped to serve. I'm sorry, Jane, I see you straining back there. Let me see if I can get her up. Um, being part of the body of Christ, you are given gifts, spiritual gifts, gifts by the Holy Spirit, in other words, that enable you to serve in particular ways. Uh, I'll give you a couple of verses here. The first one, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1, and then 4 to 7. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, here you get the service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. In other words, when you became a Christian, when you professed your faith in Jesus Christ, when you said with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you believed in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you were indwelt by the Holy Spirit at that point. Everyone who is saved in Jesus Christ is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit indwells you, he gives you specific gifts. They are not the same gifts. Every person has a different gift or gifts, sometimes it's multiple, that are given for the sake of serving the body of Christ. This is why it's not possible for somebody to be a Christian, I don't think, and never have anything to do with other Christians. Because if you are indwelt with the Spirit, there will be a drive within you to serve the body of Christ. And you can't serve the body of Christ if you never bother to see any of them or get together with any of them. We are called together as one body. We are each given a gift or gifts, and we'll talk about the particulars of that later on, for the common good, to serve the people in the body. Anyone who says, I really don't have any use for the church anymore, needs to, needs to turn around and say, well, maybe the church has a need for me. Because God, the Holy Spirit, has given me some gift or ability that the church needs. In fact, the promise is that if all the body of believers, the brothers and sisters who are part of the body of Christ, if all of them are, are together and are serving according to their gifts, there will be no needs within the body of Christ. All of the needs will be met. This is a supernatural, spiritual manifestation that the Holy Spirit will give us everything that we need for the body to be healthy. Okay. A couple of other passages. Romans 12, 4 to 8 says, For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And you will notice we form one body. Each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. Our gifts are not the same. Right? Um, and just some gifts are more obvious. I mean, the gifts of teaching or preaching or speaking in tongues are obvious. But the gifts of hospitality and of administration and of helps and of intercession, which is done in private, those are gifts too. You may not even be aware of them, but all of those will be present in the body. Yes, Jane? Is it just coincidence that it says, if your gift, as opposed to if your gifts, is this saying that you have a specialty when it comes to gifts? Well, no, I think you can have more than one gift. In fact, I think a lot of people do. It's saying you won't have all of them. Right. It's saying, you know, if, if Paul were talking to me, he said, Ross, if your gift is teaching, then teach. If your gift is discerning, which I believe is another of my gifts, then discern. Hmm. He, he'd use the singular because he's talking about each gift, but it's possible that I would have more than one. Oh. One of those references would be to me or to you, okay? Yes, right. What do you feel about a spiritual gifts inventory? Uh, in terms of a test kind of thing? Yeah, I don't think we've that... attended them, it's been very helpful. Yeah, I've taken them as well. Um, I, I think they can be helpful. Unfortunately, 
we have too much of a tendency in the Western church, you know, the Western culture, to want to have forms. You know, we need to get, and I think that if we are actually prayerful about it and if we're sensitive to it, then we can be asking the Holy Spirit, help me to understand what my gifts, and we can be affirming other people's gifts in them. To say, you have the gift of hospitality, or you have the gift of encouragement, or you have the gift of helps. Part of what our job should be is to encourage the gifts in, them, in one another. And if, if, we're, if we're doing that, if we're being spiritual and sensitive to what God has put in us, and if we affirm what God appears to have put in others, uh, one of the things that we actually are talking about doing a, a, a spiritual gift survey kind of thing, a gifts and talent, gifts, talents of time survey in the church, um, part of it is what... What do you really enjoy? Or what do you feel you're really good at? Because the way the Holy Spirit has gifted us will be the things that we enjoy and the things that we are good at and the things that people affirm in us. You know, man, you are really great at doing this, this uh, uh, construction and you know, uh, maintenance kind of stuff. Well, that's the gift of helps. Okay, there was another hand. Okay, go. Aren't there different levels of discernment? For instance, a pastor need needs to be able to discern the gifts in other people. Well, Whereas an individual member of the body needs to be able to discern what's of the Lord and what's not. Well, the gift of discernment, as, as it's described, is the ability to discern spiritual things, okay. to tell whether something is, is of the Lord or is not. Okay. There's a kind of discernment which simply means wisdom. You know, you're, and wisdom actually is, listed, is, a, is one of the gifts. Mm -hmm. So... Words like discernment can be used in, in multiple ways. The particular gift of the discernment means the ability to discern um, uh, good and evil, you know, what, what's right. And I, I said a second ago, I believe I have the gift of discernment. Uh, there are people that I have met who, with no apparent reason, something in my spirit will say, there's something not right. There's something simply not right there. And in almost every case, with that spin situation, it has proven to be true. There is a very strange, and you're going to laugh about this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Carolyn's over here. She has to tell eyes. you this. She's rolling your eyes. I don't know if this is actually part of the gift of discernment or not, but she's sitting here, and she will attest to this. When we watch TV, we're watching a, you know, a cop show or something. We'll be watching the show, and an actor will come on the screen. And I will go, bad guy, before they say anything or do anything or anything else. And I'm right about... 90% of the time? She, she doesn't want to admit it. Okay. No. Now, I don't know if that's I just part don't think it has anything to do with Well, she doesn't think it has anything to do with it. But, that's <laughs> I, but it's, it's not, and I don't know why. I mean, I don't, and I can't say why I've had sensing before about good in people or not good in people. Um, and yet, I've learned to, to trust that. Okay. What do you do with the gift of discernment? I tease the Carolyn because I can pick the bad guy every time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but do you go to the people and talk to them, or do you just keep quiet or just pray about it? Well, it will what? affect um, how, how I feel about people in positions of leadership. Oh, maybe that's not true because it's not all up to me to pick leaders. Uh, probably how quickly I will let them into confidences, or how quickly I would, you know, concede. Um, responsibilities to them or whatever. In other words, I want to go slow if I, if I get a sense of that. Well, we'll get into a particular there. But, um, you know, I believe that we do have, we do have gifts, okay? Um, in fact, we all have gifts if they are given to us. We can have more than one or we may just have one, but we all have at least one gift. Another passage, you get the idea of the number of different books. You'll notice this comes up in a lot of different places, not just in Paul, but uh, elsewhere. Uh, Ephesians 4, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers. Why? To equip his people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. We are given gifts which involve responsibilities. You'll notice apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Those are, those are the, the outworking, the description of what it looks like when you use those gifts, certain ones of the gifts, to equip his people for the works of service. So this is all tied back. We're talking here about gifts that are given, not just because they're fun. They are all given because we are supposed to use them to serve. Okay? If you do not use the gift you are given to serve, I believe you're going to be perpetually frustrated because that is how God the Holy Spirit has made you when he, when he indwelt you. 
He has made part of you to do that work of service. And until you find that thing, and until you do that thing, you're always going to be feel frustrated by it. Because something in you is not being fulfilled. You are not doing what you were intended for. Now, again, Carolyn, uh, when, I, when I graduated from seminary, my uh, preaching professor, Ian Pitt Watson, the best preacher I ever heard, this little wiry Scottish man, I told Ian I wasn't going to be ordained right then. I wasn't going into church service. And Ian, who was very soft-spoken when he wasn't in the pulpit, he was a tiger in the pulpit, but he was very soft-spoken, he looked me square in the eye, and he said, if you do not preach God's word, you are not fulfilling his plan for your life. Well, I was 27 at that time. You know, I'd been in between college and, and before I went to seminary for a while. I didn't preach. I mean, I preached a couple times here and there over the many, many years. When I got to Seattle and was working in University of Presbyterian Church, I taught a class every week for 18 years, you know, with, with very few breaks, actually. Um, and I'd go from one class to the next, and we would get 80 to 100 people or so frequently in that Sunday School for Adults, we called it. And that was very satisfying for me, but there was always still a sense that I had that something was wrong. Carolyn knows the number of times I would say to her, I don't feel like I have a legacy. I don't feel like I'm lead. There's something that, you know, that's, I'm not okay with yet. I didn't really know what that was. Through a weird series of events, you know, actually when I say that, because if certain things had been different in terms of my professional life or Carolyn or whatever, we probably wouldn't come to Mexico, but we came to Mexico, and I ended up being a pastor here. I was thinking just today about the time when Carolyn and I, it was after one week, the, we, were, we were supposed to have a visiting preacher, and they didn't show up, and so we asked people to come up for testimony, and I got up, and that was the first time I said to you all, uh, person should be ready to preach, pray, or die at any moment, okay? A Christian should be ready to preach, pray, or die at any moment. On the way home, I, Carolyn was driving, I remember exactly where we were, we were right in front of the old um, Via Del Arte restaurant, driving to our house, and I said, you know, I've been thinking about it, and if they ever wanted me to preach more often, I think I'd be open to doing that. <laughs> okay, six weeks later, yeah. I'm the pastor and preacher of Lakeside Presbyterian Church. Now I know what I was missing. Okay. Um, for 30 years almost, almost 30 years, there was something in me that I was not fulfilling. I was still teaching and I was doing okay. And yeah, there were a lot of people who, who came to my classes. But there was a sense in which God had, I think, given me to preach. That was a gift that I'd been given, and I wasn't using it. I think it's, it's okay for me to say that I have a gift of preaching. Is that okay to say? It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't want to seem immodest. <laughs> you guys, people always say, well, how was it? And I go, don't ask me. Ask the people who had to sit out there and listen to me. Okay. <laughs> but there was a sense in which I was not really fully fulfilled. There was something in me that, that as busy as I was, as much as I was doing, as satisfying as the things I did were, something still wasn't quite fulfilled in me. Because there was a gift I had been given that I had not clearly enough identified, even though Ian Pitt Watson hit me right between the eyes with it 30 years earlier almost. Um, and it was only later that I realized. Okay? So there's an extent to which if we don't identify those things and express them, we're always going to have a sense, even if we're doing other wonderful things, that something is not quite there yet. Okay? We're not quite in, the, in, the, in the, the pocket. We're not quite where we should be. Because that's how the Holy Spirit makes us. He comes into us. He remakes us in that way. All right? Another passage, 1 Peter 4, 10 to 11. Each of us should use whatever gift we have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If you speak, you should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If you serve, you should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory and power forever and ever. Now, there's an important thing here when uh, Peter says that you should use the gifts to the best of your ability, basically, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. Our service is not, just, it's not for us, although we find satisfaction in using the gifts we're given. It is not even for the people that we serve only. It is for them, but it's for more than that. It actually is to the praise of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to come back around to that in, in a minute when I get to the spiritual discipline part of this. 
Okay. Now, so you get the main point that I'm making here, that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are given to all Christians for service. Most of the verses talk about serving within the body of Christ. They, there's no one list of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's not like, okay, here are the, the six or the nine or the twelve. It's actually in several different places in Scripture. There are several different lists that overlap in places. But they include things like the gifts of prophecy, preaching, evangelism, missions. That is introducing, you know, people who aren't in your neighborhood uh, kind of thing. Like Paul was a missionary evangelist and traveling. Teaching, knowledge, wisdom, exhortation, discernment, hospitality, pastoring, giving. Compassion, music, art, and crafts. The music, arts, and crafts are especially in the Old Testament when it clearly says that it was the Holy Spirit of God that gifted the people who helped create, the, who built the temple with the art and craft that was necessary for building of the temple. And then the Holy Spirit gifted the musicians that were responsible for providing for worship. Okay, so that's an Old Testament. There's references to the, the Holy Spirit gifting people in the Old Testament too. Then intercession, which is to pray for others, healing, miracles, um, the gift of tongues, of interpretation of tongues, of faith, faith in itself, strong faith, powerful faith is a gift, leadership, administration, and helps, the willingness to simply help, to provide behind the scenes, you know, the people who wash the dishes after Second Sunday, the people who take out the garbage every week. The, those, it actually is a spiritual gift that enables people to be able to do that, to do it well and consistently. So with that long list, all of those things are given for the sake of the church. But it's also true that many of those things are gifts of service that can apply to people outside the church, which we're also called to do. Um, we're told that, you know, to be, I mentioned this in, in Sunday school, to be light and salt to the world. Well... You can't be light and salt to the world if you never get to any if you never get close enough to them for them to see you and taste you. And Jesus said they will know you're my disciples if you love one another. So we're supposed to, by our actions, we're supposed to be an example. Our actions being the, the works of service. And when you look at this list, there are a number of these things that plainly either are or could be service to people outside the body of Christ. Evangelism and missions clearly are efforts that reach outside the body of Christ because the very nature of those things by definition is you're talking to people who aren't Christians yet. Uh, the gift of knowledge, to be able to, to uh, know how to communicate with people, of wisdom, of discernment, of hospitality. We're supposed to be hospitable not only to the body of Christ but to those outside as well. Of giving, we can give to causes other than just the church. Of compassion, caring for the needs of people who are hurting and broken and lost. So some of these kids relate to each other. Um, music, art, and craft, that we can serve others with those gifts. The, the gift of intercession. We should be praying, not we should especially be praying for people within the body of Christ, but we should be praying for people outside the body of Christ too. Just because they are not believers does not mean we cannot intercede for them and ask for God's blessing and healing for them. All right? The gift of healing itself, of miracles on behalf of other people who are not believers. Um, many, many, one of the reasons that Jesus performed miracles in the New Testament, he did it out of compassion for those who had needs, but he also did it as a means of witness to show the power and love of God so that people would be drawn to him. Could you close that window just because of the noise? Uh, as it goes away, you can open it back up. Um, gifts of helps, the willingness to be able to simply do something for somebody else. Uh, as, as a way of showing love. Those are, those are examples of the gifts of the Holy Spirit that can be used outside the body of Christ, even though most of the verses we talk, uh, talk about, I mean, it also says we need to minister to the world, to show God's love to the world. That's how people get called to Him. And I think that one of the ways we do it is through these gifts of the Spirit. Now, there are several reasons why we need to serve. And remember, when we talk about these gifts, they are intended for service. They're not for their own sake. It's not like we're collecting these things because they're pretty and we can shine them and they're cool. They're given to us to use. That's the very practical side of it. Now, I believe there are three reasons why we should be serving other people using the gifts that God's given us. First, because people need our help. Again, Jesus healed people for two reasons. He did miracles for two reasons. The first one is out of compassion. 
people needed his help, and he responded by healing them. Okay? The second reason was in order to show God's power and his own authority as the Son of God so that they would come to believe in him. But first, first response was a compassionate response because people needed their help. Uh, his help. There's a lot of pain and grief and lostness in the world and in the church, and God gives us the ability to make it better. That's part of why we're here. That's as I've said before, that's why God didn't sort of vacuum to us up to heaven when we got saved. You know, we didn't get sucked into the afterlife right away. He left us behind to be his witnesses and to care for people's needs. That's our job. We wake up every morning and we have assignments to do. And it doesn't have to be something you get paid for. You know, we're called to serve people who have need. First job. 3, 17 and 18 says, If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with action and in truth. And in James it says, If you see somebody who's hungry and cold, and you say, Be warm and filled, and don't do anything about it, what good is that? James says. So, there are needs, and if we are part of the body of Christ, children and servants of God, then we have an obligation to do what we can to serve those people in order to address those needs as an act of compassion. Okay? Um, so that's one reason. A second reason is that when we help others, we are helping Jesus. Quite literally. This is not just a cute metaphor. In Acts, or I'm sorry, in Matthew 25, Jesus said this, for I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, Verily, verily, which means, well, whenever you get truly I, I tell you, or verily, verily in the King James, it means this is exactly what it sounds like. You don't need to parse this. You don't need to edit it. You don't need to interpret it. This is exactly what I mean. That's what verily, verily, or truly I say to you means, is this is what I mean. Don't try to make something different out of it. Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Notice that Jesus did not say, I will treat you as though you did it for me, or it will be like you did it for me. He quite literally says, and he even prefaces this with, verily, verily, I say to you, truly I tell you, you did it for me. Mother Teresa, I, used this, I mentioned this recently, a reporter early in Mother Teresa's days, when she was just beginning to be quite famous, she was working in Calcutta, she didn't have an international ministry. And she and the Sisters of Charity, who worked with her, would literally go out in the streets of Calcutta and gather up people who were suffering from leprosy and from various other diseases of the skin and starvation. They were dirty, they were smelly, they, you know, they were diseased. Many times these are contagious diseases. Well, a Western reporter who was visiting there, because they'd heard about this work, said to her, how can you do this? I mean, Mother Teresa was not Indian, she was Albanian, she was from Western Europe. And he said, how can you do this? I mean, really, just the stench and the awfulness of it. And Mother Teresa said, it's really not hard, because all I have to say is, it's all right, Jesus, I'm here now. And she meant that. That's what made her Mother Teresa. The idea that when we serve other people, we are in a very literal way, according to what Jesus said, not me, we are serving Him when we care about the needs of other people. And he goes even further than that. I mean, I, I give you the positive part. There's the negative side, you know. When I was hungry, you did not feed me. When I was thirsty, you did not give me something to drink. When I needed clothes, you did not clothe me. You did not visit me in prison. And they say, Lord, and they say, Lord when did we see you hungry and not feed you or thirsty, etc.? He says, as much as you did not do unto one of the least of these, you did not do it unto me. And that's the kicker. Depart from me, you accursed, into the lake of fire, prepared for the devil and his
as demons because I never knew you. That's why I think he's not just saying it's life. It really is. He's saying if we have no more love or commitment to Jesus than to leave people hungry and broken and in prison and not, not ever do anything for them, doesn't mean we have to save them all. doesn't mean we have to be perfect. But if we have no compassion for them, he's saying you didn't really love me. And so therefore you don't have a part of me. Again, that's, those aren't my words. Those are Jesus' words. And I don't believe that's salvation. I don't think that's saying you're saved because you do good works. It's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying, if you really love me, if you are part of me, if you have accepted me into your heart, which is what saves you, if you've done that, then you'll care for the broken in some way. If you haven't done anything to serve other people with the gifts I gave you, then you must not really love me. You must not have accepted me. It's not real. This is what James is saying when he says faith without works is dead. If there's nothing in your life that shows by acts of service that you mean it, then you don't mean it. Becky? Um, I, was, I was just thinking that um, when people cross our paths, I think, I think that um, it is opportunities for us to serve. Mm -hmm. And so when we when we see those people day after day, maybe she starts saying, "Okay, God, what is it you want me to do?" Because it's like what she said, "All right, Jesus, I'm here." Mm -hmm. You know, and we never know until we offer ourselves if um, you know this this is truly for you. So unless you say, "Is there anything I can do for help you?" Right. To help you. I mean, how will you ever know when you're passing that person every day or on a daily basis or or they're they're coming up to you to sell something every single day, you know, it's just an opportunity right. to show God's love. And is your heart open to that? Girl? And I think you I know you're gonna get to this, I'm sure. I think that's why it's a discipline, right? It's doing that every time or, right. or you know, at least being open to doing something every time. That's the discipline part. Right. The nature of the discipline is that you make the decision to commit yeah. yourself to something. That's part of what a discipline is. And the discipline of service means you don't just, whenever it occurs to you, or you know, oh, well, I... I have some time now. Yeah, I have some, time, I have some extra time now. Uh, it's a matter of saying, I'm going to commit myself to this because this is service to Christ. It is honoring to God. And so I'm going to do it. Bill? Well, I read Matthew 25 this morning. And I realize a lot of times I tend to avoid people that I don't know what I'm going to say. I don't know what to say. And like Becky said, I need to ask the Lord. Lord, right. give me the words to right. say. The other thing is, what about giving, giving with wisdom? I don't know, so we have to be careful. We're always finding excuses for not for not doing. And I would rather I would rather serve poorly than choose not to serve out of fear and not serving well. But I didn't refer exactly to that. I refer to uh, sometimes uh, you give some some young woman uh, that uh, needs a uh, dress, let's say, and, and you give him a dress that is totally inappropriate, you know, sexually inappropriate, I would say. That's not giving with wisdom. Okay, well, no, we're not talking about giving here, we're talking about serving. And so part of the nature of serving is that we seek to do what's in the best interest of the person. And that implies that we do what's wise for them. Okay. Yes? Talking about this reminds me of the, uh, the Good Samaritan. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Just perfect. Yeah, the Good Samaritan. I mean, I, I thought of that when Becky was talking. The idea that um, the priest, who is supposed to be the one who represents God to the people, saw somebody who had been beaten and was lying there and walked on the other side of the street. A Levite, who means they're of the tribe, that the priestly tribe, the people who were supposed to again be specially committed to God, walks on the other side. Who is it that goes to that person and gathers them up and binds their wounds and heals, you know, takes them to, to uh, some place and tells the people take care of the, the innkeeper, take care of them, and here's money, and he gave them quite a bit of money, and if it costs more than this, I'll pay you more when I come back. It was a Samaritan. The Samaritan and the Jews were supposed to hate each other. Okay? Um, this is, there was every reason in the world not to want to do that. The Levite and the priest had no excuse other than, well, 
If that person's dead, I'll make myself unclean. Oh, right, that'll th take you, what, three days to get over. You know, it's not that big a deal. But if you, if you let them die and walk on the other side, the reason Jesus told that parable is they cre created, you know, they committed horrendous sins. The one who had all the acceptable reasons for not getting involved went way above board to serve that person. And there's a reason why Jesus tells that parable, and there's a reason why it's a Samaritan, the person who had reasons not to want to help, and yet they did. Carolyn? Well, I was going to say what you said, that you can have a spiritual excuse not to do oh. it, because, oh, I'll, I'll, it would make me somehow ritually unclean right. to touch a dead body, so I better not do that. Right. You've got, you've got, you twist the whole, um, the whole reason for that stuff around. Right, and, so and, and we can find all sorts of reasons. Oh, I don't, I don't want to be associated with those people because people might think I'm like them. Yeah. Really? So you're more concerned about your reputation than you are their needs? Really? How do you think Jesus thinks about that? Uh, and, and we have sometimes out of the desire to be so self-righteous, thinking that's a good thing, mm -hmm. self-righteousness was one of the very few things that Jesus did not countenance at all. Okay, self-righteous means thinking you're good, um, there was a, my friend Richard Sears, a professor, I wonder if Richard's ever going to see these tapes and hear his name so many times. Um, Richard told me that when he first, as a professor, when he first started uh, teaching at Berea College and he started attending a student uh, Bible study, because he was Christian, the first lesson, this young man who was one of the leaders of Bible study, was teaching about the number of times that the uh, Pharisees and teachers of the law criticized Jesus for eating with tax collectors and sinners. And the teaching, this young man said, well, I mean, this just goes to show that you have to be very, very careful who you hang out with because even Jesus made the mistake of hanging around with people who tarnish his reputation. <laughs> That's not the point of that story. <laughs> um, you know, that we, we feel so self-righteous, we're going to maintain our self-righteousness by not having anything to do with the people who need us. Jesus said, I didn't come for the people who were well, I came for the people who were sick. And by, by extension, we are supposed to be there for the people who are sick. Marvin said it the other day. The church is not supposed to be a, you know, a hotel for the righteous. It's supposed to be a hospital for the sick, the sinners. All right? And we're the ones who are supposed to bring them in and care for them and love them and bind their wounds and pay for them to be cared for. All right? Okay, I'll start preaching here. Um, so the third reason I believe that we need to give is that we need to help others for our own sake. And I don't mean that in a selfish way any more than any of the spiritual disciplines in which we seek to grow more godly, we seek to pursue holiness, uh, is, is for us. When we serve others, it makes us more like Jesus. I just said Jesus reached out to the tax collectors and the sinners and the broken and the lost, those who were diseased with leprosy, a disease you weren't supposed to get close to. Legally, you weren't allowed to get close to it. And he broke that law and that rule. Uh, people who had demons, every possible bad situation in terms of somebody's brokenness in life, Jesus stepped across the boundaries that were supposed to be there to touch and to heal, to love and to care for. By extension, we are supposed to do the same things. That's what Christian service is. And when we do that, when we, when we as a discipline, when we... Um, focus our energies and our intent on being Christians who serve, we become more like Jesus. And that is, after all, the purpose of the spiritual disciplines, right? To pursue godliness, to become more like Jesus. That's why service really does need to be understood to be a, a spiritual discipline. Because as we practice it with intent unto the Lord, it makes us more like Jesus. And we need it. We need that blessing and gift. Oswald Chambers said this, The real test of a saint is not one's willingness to preach the gospel. A saint, I would define as being one who has grown in the spiritual disciplines, who has grown in godliness, right? So a saint uh, is not one who's willing to preach the gospel, but one's willingness to do something like washing the disciples' feet. That is, being willing to do those things that seem unimportant in human estimation, but count as everything <coughs> to God. Should be a two in here. I was going to hurry when I type this stuff. Um, this is the example that, you know, and, and uh, Foster talks about this a lot, the example where Jesus gets together with disciples, 
and you can sort of almost picture them sitting around, and it was supposed to be a servant who wiped your feet. In first century uh, Palestine, everybody wore sandals, which meant your feet were exposed, and it wasn't just exposed to dust and dirt, everybody had animals. They rode burrows, and they had camels, and they had various... So your feet not only had dirt on them, they had manure on them. And everything else that you can imagine that probably was unpleasant. So that's why the lowliest of servant was always the one that, uh, you, you, as an act of, of hospitality, you always washed the feet of someone who came into your home. Or you had your servant do it. You didn't do it. You had your lowest servant do it because it was an unpleasant job. <clears throat> well, the disciples get together, and they're all there, and they're kind of reclining at the couch, and there's no servants around, and none of them are going to start washing feet. They're not even going to wash their own feet. And Jesus takes a towel, takes off his outer wrap, wraps the towel around him, gets down on his hands and knees with a basin of water, and starts to wash their feet. The lowliest servant job. He gets to Peter, and Peter says, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus said, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, then you don't have any part of me. And Peter, being loudmouth Peter, said, well, then if that's the case, then wash my head and my hands also. And Jesus said, Peter, you don't need a bath. You just need your feet washed. Peter's statement, you know, well, then wash all of me, could be interpreted, or even his statement, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet could be interpreted by some people as being a statement of righteous, of good righteousness. You know, of, oh, Lord, I, I serve, you don't serve me. It wasn't, it was pride. <coughs> Peter had very much a sense that, you know, if Jesus is in charge, he shouldn't wash my feet, because I know if I was in charge, I wouldn't be washing his feet. Mm -hmm. So that was not a positive when, Jesus, when Peter said that. But Jesus, after he washed their feet, he said, okay, guys, now notice what I just did for you. Do this for each other from now on. That's the model. We become like Jesus. Yes, Barbara? I hate to be irreverent, but when I read that, I went, what, you can't wash your own feet? Yeah. And we're all so important <laughs> that you can't wash your own feet? Yeah. And I thought, eh, men. Amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> That's the sort of thing in that day was there was, real, there was a real stigma to that. Again, it was perceived as being something that nobody with any standing at all would do something like that. Mary? I think because we need to serve, like we need to give, that takes away some of that pressure of being totally wise about it or totally discerning about it because it's fulfilling something in us regardless of how it helps that person exactly. Yeah. Well, and, and uh, again, uh, with me a little bit, and I know Foster goes into the thing that in its purest sense, service by definition, Christian service by definition, is not concerned with being taken advantage of. See, many of us will not will not put ourselves in a place where we're, we're serving if it feels to us like, well, if I start doing that for that person, they're going to start taking advantage of me, and I am not going to be taken advantage of, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Well, true service doesn't think that way. True service is one in which you know, a servant, doulos is the Greek word, which is, we translate servant because we're more comfortable with the word servant, the Greek word is slave. We are to be slaves to Christ. You know, here, uh, Paul describes himself as the doulos to the kyrios, the slave to the Lord. And that literally means you don't get to decide. You serve at whatever the need is that exists. And you don't decide, well, I'm not going to do that because I'll be taken advantage of. You're a slave. And that, that and Foster does a good job of describing how that is so hard for us to, to accept or conceive of. We, use, we try to use softer words for it. But that literally is what it means. If we are serving to, to Christ, if our service is seen as being to Christ, then all of the service should be without us being concerned about being taken advantage of. This is why in the historic you know, monastic orders of the church, Western and Eastern, it involved things like obedience was one of the standard rules of monastic order. Silence, chastity, poverty, obedience. And I'm sure that not every abbot of every monk was always completely fair, even if they tried to be. And yet obedience was you learn to do what those who have been put in a position above you tell you to do. 
And again, our Western mindset goes, I don't think so. <laughs> well, that's where our problem is. <coughs> we are more concerned about me staying on top or near the top instead of serving in Christ. Jane, you had your hand up? Yeah, I think another reason hesitating to serve um, is actually fear. Let me give you an example. Um, a couple of weeks ago, Cruz Roja sponsored a thing for CPR. I always like, I don't want to know CPR. Because then, if somebody like was down in the gutter, uh, Lord, I wouldn't be able to help them. But does this make any sense to you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have to see here. <laughs> don't, you guys, I'm not real good at it, so don't. Don't have art at that. Exactly. But, but I do think sometimes we're fearful of stepping That we won't do it well. That, that we won't do it well. Correct. Yes. Chesterton said, anything worth doing is worth doing badly. <laughs> We're used to anything worth doing is worth doing well, which we, we mean, okay, do your best. That's fine. Chesterton goes deeper when he said, anything worth doing, if it's really worth doing, serving Jesus Christ by serving other people. If it's really worth doing, do it even if you can't do it well. Even if the best you can do is to do it badly, if it's worth doing, do it anyway. Do you see the wisdom in that? Do you all get that? I hear what you're saying, Jane, and yet, and, and there, yeah, I mean, there are things in the secular world, but I'm right here with you, I know what you mean. But who wants to get up front when you know you don't know what you're doing? Okay? Or if somebody's life depends on it. Um, and yet, when we talk about acts of Christian service, if we're doing it unto the Lord, if our goal is to use the gifts God has given us, to serve, you know, Jesus in serving those in need. Even if we're not sure, even if even if the devil is saying, is whispering all the things in my ear, I'm not the best person to do this. I don't know if I'm up to this. I'm not really confident. Maybe I should wait. I'll take a class. Maybe I can, you know, and on and on and on. You can see it. How many different excuses we can find. Many of them sound very legitimate. And I'm not picking on you because you're not talking about spirit. You're not talking about <coughs> service. Uh, we can, we can allow the devil or our own selves to talk us out of doing anything out of lack of confidence or competence, perceived competence. But anything really worth doing, serving Jesus Christ by serving others is worth doing. Anything worth doing is worth doing badly. And it will make us more like Jesus. Okay, Rich? I read sometime it says if you want to know uh, if you make a good servant, wait till you feel like you're treated like one. Okay. Nor is the concern perhaps that uh, they're going to take advantage of me somewhere in a little gray area where, well, I prayed and it doesn't work, so I'm going to quit praying. Uh -huh. yeah. 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 Well, you know what? I tell you, if you really, um, I, I think that's true. Our, it's our lack of faith, in other words. It's our own lack of willingness to right. to do what was mentioned in the Bible school this morning, and that is like the woman who is who's appealing to the unrighteous judge that we keep coming back for more. Or like the neighbor who goes to, his, goes to his friend's house and said, I just had people drop in for a visit. I need, some, I need to borrow some bread. And he goes, no, I'm in bed with my children, he says. In our case, we were in bed with our dogs. And I'm not going to get up and bring, you know, give you bread. And yet, because the neighbor keeps knocking on the door insistently, you will give up and get up and give it to him. We lack the faith to be persistent. Sometimes we then lack the faith to accept the answer when it's clear to us. All right, but... Um, I think that that's part of it. And some of it is we lack faith that God is really in charge, and so we think we might be taken advantage of. I would rather err on the side of being taken advantage of than err on the side of not being willing to do service that I'm called to do. Okay? Uh, the Good Samaritan served over the top. He gave lots of money, and uh, he didn't just sort of, you let me bandage up and Good luck and hope you make it to the next hotel. Exactly. You know, Jesus with the 5,000, when they finished, they had 12 basketfuls left over. It was the case that everybody got a little piece of fish and a little piece of bread and some get you till tomorrow and then somebody else will take over. I love what we do here with the table of cakes and coffee and so on after the service. Traditionally with children, we say, well, just one piece, just one piece. And isn't it wonderful you can say, not 
take ten pieces, but have two or three. Yeah, these, these young minds are going to say, this is such a wonderful place to come to, even if, just because of the tasty things that they fill their stomach with. And we say, well, we, we make so much and they gobble up so much. That's wonderful. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, uh, we, we have had a little bit of a problem on the second Sundays because we had some kids and some people who went through the line first who took enough for five people and then threw most of it away and then the people at the end didn't get any. Yeah. So, well, that's a problem that, you know, that Paul talked to the Corinthians about, <laughs> to be quite honest. You know, they had. So we're trying to balance that up. But you're right. I mean, I, there have been things where, you know, in our church where the natural thing, somebody would say, well, let's charge for it. You know, we'll charge people for that. And I go, no, let's give it to them. All right? As often as possible, as much as we can, we want people to say, Boy, they're generous. Yeah, not a couple of crumbs, but here, have another piece. Yeah, yeah, and not generous because we want to get credit, but we want to say, that's a church I want to be part of. Because when they say that, then they are they become present at the body of Christ and hopefully become part of the body of Christ, and their relationship with God changes. And that's the business we're in. And if that means we give everybody an extra cookie, I'm good with that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Oh, Talk about cookies. All right. Um, one other quote I wanted to give you. Albert Schweitzer, who was uh, a believer. I mean, Albert Schweitzer was a quite famous man when he gave up his his life in Europe to go to Africa to care as a doctor for people in need. One of the first grand examples of somebody who sacrificed success in order to use his skills to care for people in need. And Schweitzer said. One thing I know, the only ones among you who will be really happy are those who have sought and found how to serve. That's back to what I was saying earlier. If you have gifts, if you have the ability to serve and you don't use them, and maybe you don't use them because you haven't found them yet, look for them then, then you're always going to have a sense in which something is not fulfilled in you. Something is not complete in you. And if, it, and if, you, if it's a radical departure from what you ought to be doing, then you'll actually be unhappy until you sort it out. Um, so, talking about serving, um, some quotes about serving Christ and Dwight assigned task being unworthy. D.L. Moody, famous Dwight Moody from uh, Moody Bible Institute, the, you know, the Moody Church in Chicago, he said, there are many of us that are willing to do great things for the Lord, but few of us are willing to do the little things. There is huge truth in this. John Calvin, our very own John Calvin. Uh -oh. There is no work, however vile or sordid, that does not glisten before God. And D.L. Moody again. <coughs> A good many people are kept out of the service of Christ, deprived of the luxury, I love that, deprived of the luxury of working for God, because they are trying to do some great thing. Let us be willing to do little things. And let us remember that nothing is small in which God is the source. When we talk about service, we're not talking about launching a new ministry to do blah, blah. If God's calling you to that, that's wonderful. But maybe God is calling you to take out the trash at church. Or to, you know, take breakfast to your neighbor who's been laid up sick. Or something that people might not even be aware of. It might be a matter of being disciplined in praying. For somebody in the quiet of your own prayer closet with nobody else knowing about it. I, I think that as part of the spiritual discipline of service, part of what we need to do is to look for, intentionally, be thoughtful in looking for the little things, the unnoticed things, the unexpected things. That's part of what makes this a spiritual discipline. And the reality is that those little things if we do them under the Lord as an act of the spiritual discipline of service, can be the very things that God can cause to explode in somebody else's life without us even being aware of it. Okay? That we don't even know about. An example popped into my head that I've used before that I, and I, and I, I, I didn't do this intentionally, I didn't do it because I, I was great, I'm not bragging about this, it was completely un... Not willful on my heart, my part, but later on I thought maybe God would use it. I told the story about the plumber that I had. I got a call one day at work that there was water running out the windows of my condo unit, which was on the ground floor. I got there, and it wasn't that the water filled up the condo was running out, it was coming down through the walls. By the time I got there, the fire department had all my stuff out in the yard, and a plumber was, I'd just gotten there, and a plumber showed up. Well, I was feeling in a good mood that day. I was, you know, happy in the Lord, whatever it was. And he said, man, this is horrible. I, I'm sorry you got all this going on. He was a huge guy, like 400 pounds. 
And I said, well, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And that's just how I said it. And that's how I was feeling at the time. And he said, wow, I can't believe you'd say something like that. A few weeks later, I needed a plumber. You know, we got it all fixed, got the stuff moved back in. A few weeks later, I needed a plumber. And I called the plumber, and I called the number, and a woman answered the phone. And I said, hi, this is Ross Arnold, and is this Al of Lala's house? And she said, uh, yes. She, and I said, well, I need a plumber. He did some stuff for me. And she said, well, I'm his wife. He died two weeks ago, or a week ago, or ten days ago, whatever it was. Ever since then, I mean, the guy was noticeably struck. When I said, well, the Lord give us and the Lord take it away, blessed be the name of the Lord. I mean, he was really kind of rocked back by that. To this day, I'm thinking, Lord, I hope and pray that maybe that stuck a little bit. Mm -hmm. Now, again, I'm, I'm not tooting my own horn by any wild means, but that, that strikes me as an example how without intending to, I was able to say something or do something that hopefully maybe made a difference in the life of somebody that not long after that was called to present himself before the Lord. Do you have opportunities to do that, particularly through acts of service, to be an example? That's the sort of thing that makes this a spiritual discipline, is that we intentionally look for things, and especially for little things that we might do. Rick Warren, you all know Rick Warren, the, the uh, pastor, founder and pastor of Saddleback Church in Southern California, one of the biggest churches in the world. Um, he uh, started that church, you know, with just a, like, a few couples. And it's grown. He was called, the U.S. News and World Report called him one of the ten most influential people on the planet. Okay, That's not a Christian magazine, U.S. News and World Report. Because of a lot of things he's done, he's put together a network of people around the world who respond to disasters. You know, not just natural disasters, but human disasters. And very influential. His books, like The Purpose Driven Church, has been very helpful to us as we've created what our church is supposed to be about. Well, Rick Warren wrote the book, The Purpose Driven Life which was the first book before the Purpose Driven Church. And it's one of the best-selling books in all history. Many of you probably have read it or have it. I heard Rick Warren speak at a conference about stewardship. And he said, you know, to be quite honest with you, the book, The Purpose Driven Life, has made me a lot of money. In fact, the, the, um, the royalties on that book, my wife and I could buy a little island someplace and have somebody serving us little drinks with umbrellas in them for the rest of our lives. But then he said something important. I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to get stewardship in a minute. He said, but you know what? That's not what life is for. That little piece of wisdom was worth everything else I heard at that conference. Having somebody serve me the rest of my life because I can afford it, even if I can afford it, is not what life is for. And it's especially true if you're a Christian. We are not here to be served by God or by anybody else. We're here to serve. That's where we find our fulfillment. That's where we find our satisfaction. That's what God's desire for us. That is how we are like Christ. Christ did not come to be served. He had a right to be. Of all, he's the only one who did have a right to be. And yet, he came to serve. Who are we to think that that same thing should not be true of us? Right? Uh, a couple more quotes about this being our call as Christians. John Wesley said, Do all the good you can by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, do all the people you can, as long as ever you can. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> That's the Christian call. That's another way of saying we are not here in order to be served. We're here to serve. That doesn't mean you should never take a vacation and have somebody, you know, bring you a drink. <laughs> you're sitting in your chair. Caroline used to joke, but because there was an ad on TV, this woman is like, she, her eyes just flutter open, and there's this beach, you know, this, like, a, a cabana boy there, and he's got a towel over his arm and goes, Miss Johnson, it's time for your massage. <laughs> well, Carolyn always said, he's handsome, he's not very massage. <laughs> All right, to do that for a week or two a year, in order to relax and recuperate, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying, but if you think that's the purpose of your life, is to get to the place where you can do that all the time, you're missing the point. That's not, if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that's not why we're here. And even if you physically are not able to go out, you know, deliver meals or do whatever it is, you can pray. 
you can love, you can be hospitable. Okay? There are still a lot of things that you can do in service to others and to the kingdom and to the body. Right? And uh, one of my favorite quotes, but brace yourself, <laughs> Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. I think Dietrich Bonhoeffer knew what he was talking about because he literally was executed in a concentration camp near the end of the war. What he's talking about there is not just physically to die, even though that we, it may come to that. It did for him, it might to us. But when he calls us, when Christ calls us, he calls us to die to ourselves. It's another way of saying the point isn't for me to work hard and make enough money so that somebody serves me little drinks with them, drinks with little umbrellas in them the rest of my life, but rather for me to find ways to serve others. That's what it means for me to die to self, and to live in Christ, to be like Him, to serve. That's why this is a discipline of service. Okay? We cannot all be Mother Teresa, or probably we can't. God's calling you to that, and good on you. But we can do something in response to the call to serve other people. All right? If you want to grow spiritually, if you want to grow more like Christ, you have to find ways to serve, and ideally to serve in little ways, not the big ways that you get credit for. See, I got it easy. <laughs> My gifts are preaching and teaching, and I'm up front, and everybody's always telling me how wonderful I am. Well, mostly. <laughs> Not always. That's easy. It's the people who do the stuff behind the scenes. The unnoticed, unpleasant, unrewarded stuff. They're the true saints of God. When we get to heaven, the people with the best seats at the table, at the banquet of the great king, the ones who are going to be the guests of honor are going to be people you absolutely did not expect. Because they were the ones that weren't noticed and weren't visible and weren't showy, but they they got it done behind the scenes and they reflected the truth of what Jesus was all about. So we need to look for ways we can serve him better than that too. Right. You know, one thing in terms of service that, that really kind of struck me yesterday we were the meeting of, of the service and communications committee. And while I was there I couldn't help but think. The people come into the church on Sunday morning they have no idea what it took to put all the details of that service in right. place. The bulletins, the, the posters, the, the inserts. It's amazing. There's so many people working behind the scenes just to make Sunday morning. Right. And we are really blessed. I mean, we have so many people who work so very hard. I mean, we, we joke, we tease each other about the fact that in our new church we're going to have to have a dormitory because some people are here so much working so hard they need some place to sleep. Um, but we have people who are absolutely committed to the work of the Lord, and they do it here, and you're, you're completely right. Most of them do it behind the scenes. They don't get credit for it. Nobody's even aware of what's going on. Like I say, I got it easy. I get up there, and everybody thinks, I'm great. I'm, you know, we got all these other people who are working so very, very hard, and they are doing it under the Lord as acts of service. And people who you don't, don't know about, who every week are driving around to deliver food to poor families, and to deliver milk people who have families with kids, and to, you know, to care for, to, to collect food and take it to Operation Compassion, Operation Feed, etc. People who are doing acts of service and else. Those are people of God. I think one thing it takes to serve is to have compassion. Because mm -hmm. if you don't have compassion, uh, you're doing it for another reason. Yeah, yeah and Foster talks about that. Stuff. Okay, let's take a break. <clears throat> I now want to talk for the next 35 minutes or so about the question of stewardship. Um, uh, okay. I'll start with um, a verse. This is from 2 Timothy 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Notice it's not root of all evil, all kinds of evil. 
Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, you will lay up, for, you will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. This passage in Timothy runs against the grain of everything Western culture has taught us. The fact is, the reason why I wanted to deal with stewardship as a particular area of, of spiritual disciplines is because I believe the one thing in our Western culture that is most likely to block our spiritual development, to prevent us from becoming more Christ-like, to prevent us in our efforts to pursue godliness, the greatest barrier to us is our relationship with money and material possessions. Because even if you're really good at this, you probably have still fallen into the trap of having the attitudes and the, the values about material possessions that the West has, the Western world. I have. Okay, I struggle against that. Um, so when we talk about spiritual development, one of the greatest things that could be a barrier to your spiritual growth, your spirituality, your godliness, is your relationship with money and material possessions. Now, in this we're talking about stewardship. The definition of stewardship, very simply, and I'm going to talk about this in more detail in a second, Stewardship means recognizing that you don't own anything, that everything belongs to God, and He is just having you take care of it till He comes back. That's what a steward is. It's somebody who takes care of the owner's things for Him. Stewardship means understanding that we don't own anything. All of it belongs to God, and we are simply taking care of it for Him. And I'll get into some more detail about that in a minute. Now, why has God made us stewards or caretakers of his stuff. I believe that he's done so for two reasons. The first reason is that God wants us to do more than just survive. God has made us stewards over the possessions that we have in this world because he wants us to be happy. He wants us to enjoy the things of this world. God specifically says in scripture, the passage I just read included the, the scripture that says God gives us things for our enjoyment. 1 Timothy 6.17. Yeah, I just read you the larger passage this is part of. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. God wants us to enjoy our lives. God is not a stingy God. God is not intending for us just barely to survive in this life. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He wants us to have abundant life. That means to enjoy the things of this world. Why do you think that, you know, we eat for fuel, right? Our body has to have food for fuel. Well, why don't we just all just eat vitamin-enriched, you know, oatmeal? Why is that? Why don't we just take pills and then fiber to bulk up? God gives us food that is pleasurable, that we can enjoy. God gives us the beauty of nature and the sunshine. God gives us things in his creation, including the things that we have responsibility as <coughs> stewards or caretakers of, because he wants us to enjoy them. He wants us to have a good life. He is not a stingy God. And so I think that we need to realize that God wants us to enjoy the things of this world. That's the first thing. The second reason I believe that God gives us the responsibility to be stewards or caretakers of his stuff is because he wants us to take responsibility to share it with the people who have need, wherever and whenever they are in need. If you, if you stop with just the first one, that the stuff that, that I'm taking care of for God is entirely for my enjoyment, then you will very quickly run into the judgment of God for that, because that's not the only reason you have this stuff. God also wants you to share with those who are in need. Matthew 6, Jesus says, So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full by being, getting accolades. 
But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Do you hear the assumption in, in that st those statements? When you give to the needy, what is the assumption in that? You will. That you're going to. We have an obligation. There is an assumption on the part of Jesus that we are going to use the blessings he has entrusted to us to help care for the needs of those that are in the world. Now, the several principles that I would start with, um, stewardship. The first principle is God owns everything. All right? Everything belongs to God. I said that already. You need to realize that God owns your property, that is your house, your car, your cash, your spouse, your children, everything that you have ultimately belongs to God. And as I said, the definition of stewardship is to recognize that God owns everything and that you are simply taking care of it. So if you really believe this, that God is the owner of everything, and Psalm 24.1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Scripture tells us that very plainly. I'm not, I'm not having to extrapolate from this. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If we realize that that's true, the question we need to ask ourselves then is, what are we going to do with God's stuff until he comes back? That's what stewardship is. Stewardship is us saying God owns everything, and what are we going to do with God's stuff until he returns? The second point, I'll, I'll restate these, God has made us caretakers for our own enjoyment and to share with others in need. And since God, um, okay, uh, let me come back to that. What, the, the point, what does God want us to do with his stuff? I think the, there was a cartoon in the, that I referred to, it was in the New Yorker years ago, and I wish I had cut it out, because I, I use this all the time when I talk about our relationship with the, with the world. And, it's two guys in sort of smoking jackets and cravats, and they're holding martinis in their hand, and they're looking out, you know, one of the New Yorker cartoons, they're looking out this giant picture window at these rolling hills and trees and everything, this beautiful scenery. And the caption, one of the guys is saying, well, yes, I suppose God made it, but I own it. <laughs> okay? The reason that's so funny is that down deep, we inherently know that's not true. God did make it. And God owns it. You may have the deed, but how long is that going to last when everything else burns? Okay. God owns everything. We own nothing. He has asked us to take care of it. First, to, to enjoy it. And secondly, in order for us to be able to care for those in need. Um, the third point I would want to make is that since God already owns everything, He does not need for you to give for him to accomplish his will in the world. I said before, God is not sitting on his throne, wringing his hands, saying, I sure hope those people in Lakeside get to the church this week, because if they don't, then my will will not be manifest in Lakeside, you know. No. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Psalm 50, which is right here, says, I have no need of a bull from your stall or of goats from your pens, for every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and the creatures of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all that is in it. God does not need for us to give to the church or the things of God or to anything else for his will to be done. God doesn't need us to do that. So why should we give? Why are we talking about giving as part of a spiritual discipline? Well, as I said earlier, our relationship with money and spiritual possessions, or physical, I'm sorry, material possessions, is one of the biggest barriers spiritually that we have. You can do everything else we've talked about. You can read the Bible and study it. You can pray. You can worship. You can learn of God. You can fellowship. You can do all of that stuff. And if you have a typical Western culture relationship to money and material possessions, you will not experience spiritual growth in godliness. For so many people, mammon, which is the, the old word for money, material goods, really is our God. 
whether we admit it or not. It's the thing we think about all the time. Do you think more about God or do you think about how the stock market is doing now? All right? Do you spend more time reading your Bible or working on your finances? There are so many different ways in which money and material possessions affect us. And money, and this is one of the very strange things, our Western spirituality, I believe, is so shallow because of our orientation toward money and, uh, and material possessions, our unhealthy relationship with money. And wherever your heart is, Scripture tells us, um, wherever our, our purse is, our heart's going to be. I mean, we, we're, it's, it's all bound up together. Let me give you the passages here. Matthew 6. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break and seal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. And for where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Where are you investing yourself in treasure? Is it in money and material possessions, or is it in the things of heaven? I mentioned uh, that the passage that I read earlier from Timothy ends by saying... Oh, I'll find it. Um, talk amongst yourselves. Okay. Um, command those who are who to do good, to be rich in good deeds, generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up for themselves treasures as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. <coughs> The conference I went to where Rick Warren and Randy Alcorn both spoke, it was called uh, The Life That Is Truly Life. That was the name of the conference. It was about stewardship. And these two guys, both of whom have gotten very wealthy off of books they've written, um, neither of them have, like I say, Rick Warren, that was the conference, which he said, I, my wife and I could buy an island and have somebody serve us little drinks with umbrellas in the rest of our lives, but that's not what life is for. Uh, Rick Warren, when he did start making all this money from his books, the first thing he did was he paid back Saddleback Church every penny they had ever given him as the minister there. And then he and Randy Alcorn, separately, became reverse tithers, which means they give away 90% of their money and they keep 10. Right? Randy Alcorn had this great saying based upon this idea that um, in where your treasure is, there your heart is also. He said, if we're investing our treasure in and giving things back to the things of God, if God has blessed us with material resources, especially that are significant, and Randy Alcorn said, I was on a trip, I just got home for the weekend, I was only there for the weekend, and then I came to this conference, and at the weekend, some of my books have done really well, and I was able to write checks for $250,000 to Christian Ministries my wife and I support. He said, do you not believe that made me feel good to be able to do that? Do you not believe that was hugely satisfying to me? Now, you may not be able to write checks for $250,000 to kingdom work, but you might be able to write $250 or $500 or $1,000 or $5,000 and feel the satisfaction. The idea is that you're investing in the things of God, in kingdom work. Wherever your money goes, wherever your treasure goes, that's where your heart's going to be. And as Randy Elkhorn said, you can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. <laughs> You can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. That's actually from a passage that Paul says that thank you for giving to my support. And I say that not because I really care, because I've learned to be satisfied in whatever situation I'm in. But I am grateful because it is credited to your account, suggesting that there is an account in heaven. That's what Alcorn meant by you can send it on ahead. That God recognizes and acknowledges this. You don't have an actual bank account, but you have a spiritual account that you're contributing to. And from Proverbs 30, keep falsehood, and this is a wonderful passage that you don't get quoted that often. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Now, you get too much money, then you stop recognizing that the Lord is the Lord. Or I may become poor and steal, and so dishonor the name of my God. The idea here that money and treasure can have a spiritual effect on us is affirmed in what Jesus talks about. That there really is a spiritual impact on money. In fact, Jesus gives money and material possessions more attention 
Jesus talks about them more than any other single thing other than the kingdom of God. He talks about money, how you spend your money, what you do with your material possessions more than any other single thing. I mean, think about the number of times he talks about the widow's mind and the rich young ruler and the talents. A talent was a, a, was a unit of money back then, by the way, quite a big unit of money. And on and on. All these different stories, all these different passages. Jesus talked about money, and he gave money quite a bit of authority in terms of its effect on us spiritually. From Matthew 6, Jesus said, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Pick. It's either or. It's not both and. You have to decide, am I serving God or am I serving God? Money, my pocketbook, what's my focus? That doesn't mean it's, it's not legitimate to have a bank account or even a savings account. The question is, what is your relationship with your money? And Paul in 2 Corinthians 8 says, And just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. And he's talking about giving money here. <coughs> 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 are the New Testament's fundraising letter. Paul is writing to the Corinthian church and asking them to fulfill the pledge they made to give for the sake of the church in Judea, the original mother church that was suffering from a famine. And so we need to understand through all of these passages that Jesus and Paul, all of Scripture, is telling us that, it, um, that our relationship with money affects us spiritually in a way that maybe nothing else quite does. When we give to God, giving can be a positive spiritual issue for us because it gives us a balance, a more balanced, a healthier relationship with the thing that is a huge problem in Western society, and that is our relationship with money and material goods. When we give to the things of God, there is positive benefit to us. In fact, C.S. Lewis said one time, somebody asked him, how much should I give to the church? And Lewis said, you know, I don't really know how much we should give other than we should give more than we can spare. <laughs> Why do you think he said that? We should give more than we can spare. Give to the church. Because you give to the spare. Things. What's that? It's very hard to spare something. Okay. I mean, you know, most of the time we don't, if we wait around until what we can spare, we don't give anything. Don't have anything. Right. We don't exactly. have anything left over. I can always find some other reason for it. Mm -hmm. And I think what Lewis is saying is that if I give beyond what I think I can spare, that means I actually am practicing as a, as a discipline. Mm -hmm. I'm giving to the things of God first, not easiest. I'm giving as a way of saying, Lord, I commit this to you, not because, oh, i got a little less. For sure, you can have a God. No, no sweat off my back. i still got everything I want. I really like that thing Lewis said. I don't know exactly how much we should give, except it should be more than we can spare. It needs to be something as a discipline where it makes a difference to us. If it's always just easy breezy, then there's no discipline. There's no sense of sacrifice. There's no sense of it really being a commitment that we're, we're giving in love. <laughs> or that we're even recognizing that it's not really my stuff anyway, it's God's. And I, want, and I should be giving it back to Him generously, beyond the point even that I'm necessarily comfortable with. We should give more than we can spare. So when we give, we are tearing down some of the barriers that Western culture has tried to teach us. Barriers to our spiritual growth. On the other hand, when we don't give in the way that God commands us, I believe that we are creating an unhealthy relationship between ourselves and our money that keeps all those other things that you might be trying to do from growing in you. I think that that's what this passage is about. When it says, keep falsehood and lies far from me, give me neither property riches nor give me only my daily bread, otherwise I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Too much money? defeats your desire to be spiritually more in tune with the Lord, more like Jesus. And we have to accept that as a reality that Scripture teaches us. We are all prone, in what, because we are part of a Western culture, we are all prone to have more money than is good for us. 
more material possessions than is good for us. And I'm right there. Okay? I'm not just preaching to you. You too. But when we break the bondage of material possessions that many of us have, when we are generous, when we give, especially when we give back to the things of the kingdom work and the things of, of God through the church, but even when we give to the needs of people who are poor, you know, to, to the needs that exist, when we do that, when we give in that way, we break that bondage that we are inclined to, and I believe we sort of open up the causeway so that our spirituality can be freer to, to act. When we give back to God, it becomes a demonstration of our love for God and our love for others, and so it's a critical part of us growing in that love, of growing to be more like Jesus as part of the road to our spiritual maturity, of our growth in godliness. And I believe that's the power of giving. It really is a, a, a kind of service, a specialized kind of service. But the main thing I wanted to talk about this today for is that given where we all come from in Western culture, <coughs> if we don't recognize the dangers of our relationship with money and material possessions, then almost everything else I've talked to you about in this spiritual disciplines class is not going to really work for you. Now, if that's not true, if you don't have that, you know, that uh, attachment to material possessions, like most of Western culture does, if you really have released yourself from that, God bless you, good on you. But if you find that these spiritual disciplines don't seem to be working for you, the couple of things you need to look at is, what is my relationship to money and material goods? Is there unconfessed sin in my life, is another one, or is there a broken relationship I need to be aware of and address? Those are three of the biggest things that keep people from growing spiritually, even if you're trying to practice the disciplines we're talking about. Unhealthy relationship with money material possessions, uh, unconfessed sin in your life that you're not willing to admit to, and, and or a broken relationship with someone. But money is the one that most people are. And let me talk for just a second about the very practical ramifications of us giving back to God and giving back to people in need of the resources we have, since it's all God's anyway, and He wants us to share it with people in need. Studies have shown amongst Christians, now we are not under the law that says we, we're supposed to tithe, that we have to give 10%. Tithe means to give 10%. It's a good rule of thumb. To me, tithing is the minimum amount we ought to be giving as a sign of the fact that Everything is God's, and he's blessed us to be able to enjoy it, but we need to give it back to him. So a tithe is simply a good handle for us to work with. Um, research has shown that half of all the Christians in America, you Canadians and Mexicans are off the hook here, half of all Christians, that is, people who attend church and profess to be followers of Jesus, half of all Christians never give anything to the church. Bupkis, zip, nada. Of the people who do give to the church, less than 6% of them tithe or give 10%. Less than 6%. Even though 17% of them claim they do. Oops. Almost three times <coughs> they claim they tithe. And they have 88 minutes, I don't even know where they are. But what a study has shown that if Christians just in the United States were to actually tie, that is, give 10% of their income back to the church and the needs of other people, within 10 to 12 years, <coughs> losing that money, tithing from Christians just in America, not Canada or Mexico or Europe, just in America, that would be more than double the amount of money that is needed to stop all starvation and malnutrition on the whole planet, to provide clean water and sanitation to everybody on earth, and to ensure that every child would get an education. Can you say that one more time? Yeah, if, if, <laughs> if uh, Christians in the United States were to tithe, give 10%, that would be more than double the amount needed to stop all starvation, all malnutrition, to provide clean water and sanitation to everybody on the planet and ensure that every child got an education. In other words, another way to say it, if the Christians just in the United States were doing even half of what the accepted standard is in terms of service financially, of giving, you know, if, if Christians gave on average 5%, within 10 years there would be no hunger or starvation or malnutrition or lack of sanitation or lack of education. In the whole world. In the whole world. 
bet taxes will go down too. Taxes will go down too. <laughs> we'd be out of work. So do you see, that's also an aspect of, do you see how stewardship is an aspect of service? We talk about meeting the needs of people who have needs. And, and I have to say it, shame on us. We should be ashamed of ourselves. All of us Christians. And I own, you know, I, Carolyn and I try very hard to do this, but I, I, I have a sense of ownership, owning the responsibility for all the Christian church, that we are so pitiful that we would give so little. And what is wrong with us, Michael? There's an attitude, and maybe it comes from this Western privilege, materialism, I'm not sure. But when we see people that are truly, truly poor or struggling, it's like, I mean, I've seen this. Um, they don't, they're not doing something right with God. There's something that's not right. So I, I'm not even going to devote my time or money or effort. Oh, God help the people who believe that. Towards, mm -hmm. towards it. That's the most heinous kind of sin. I'm not going to help somebody because it's their own fault. Talk about blaming the ticket. Yeah, but I've seen, I've seen that. And some from church members. Okay, members. exhort them to think differently if you, if you have people think about it. That's simply not true. I mean, you know, Jesus was poor materially. Does that mean he was, it's his own fault? He's a sinner? But these are the things that are said. Yeah. We see people on exit ramps in the, in the U.S. holding up cardboard signs. Of, and, I mean, I've heard them from preachers' mouths and from deacons and elders' mouths. Well, Car Carolyn and I had the experience. You know, again, I taught for 18 years or so at, at University Press in Seattle. And because I was teaching scripture or whatever, and because Jesus talks so much about money, you know, money and material possessions and our relationship with them and what that means spiritually is so much a part of scripture. I came across that stuff a lot. And Carolyn and I, whenever I saw that coming, Carolyn and I just waited. We were just expecting the first yes, but. Where somebody would say, well, yes, but, you know, you don't really have to get Things like, and this was a real one. Well, yes, but in Jesus' time, people had to give to the temple because the temple took, and the temple... Um, took care of people's needs, and so they had to tithe in order to take care of people's needs. But I pay taxes, and my taxes take care of poor people now, so I don't need to tithe. Your soul is at the edge of hell, my friend. <coughs> Depart from me, you are cursed, the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his demons, because you would not care for those in need. You pay your taxes? God doesn't need your money! That's completely wrong. The idea is I don't need to tithe because I pay taxes and the taxes care for poor people. Your tithing isn't to care for poor people, although it will do that. Your tithing is because you need it. You need it spiritually. And if you think you don't tithe, you don't give to the things of God because you pay your taxes, then you are one screwed up person spiritually. Not to put too fine a point on How do you feel? Mary? <laughs> isn't that part of uh, our the New Age influence in the Western world and the idea of karma and you've got to work out your own problems and... Well, I, I talked about that when we were discussing anthropology. That, you know, if you, believe, if you have uh, an Eastern, sort of an Eastern philosophical view of what human beings are and that somebody who's broken or lost or whatever, they're working out their own karma and so I shouldn't mess with them. You know, that's a anthrop Christian anthropology question. But it's gone back a lot further, you know, <coughs> It's, it goes back to the time of Jesus. I mean, the reason he talks so much about money is they were messed up about it then too. All right, the Pharisees, the Jews, actually had gotten to the place not because you know they got gotten the place where they thought if you were rich, it's called God, God blessed you. If you're poor, it's called God, God cursed you. And I think some people still hold to that. That may be where some of what you're talking about is coming from. But the fact is that our biggest danger is a wrong relationship with our money our biggest spiritual danger is our wrong relationship with money and so giving generously is a critical step in us growing spiritually it's not confusing the material things with the spiritual things because the point isn't the money god doesn't need your money you need to give it because the question is your spiritual relationship with your money that, and again, people have people are always looking for an excuse. For that, that's the yes but. Always some excuse that I don't have to actually give. Should I tithe on my gross or my net? That's the wrong question. 
that question implies you're trying to get away with as little as you possibly can, which means you don't really understand that it's not yours in the first place. Look for opportunities to give as much as you can and have a minimum standard. Don't look for opportunities to give as little as possible and feel like you're, you know, I, I, I've met the requirement, I've checked the box, God has to be okay with me. All right? That's the wrong spiritual understanding. Somebody once said, you know, in answer to, do you tithe on your grocery or net? Well, do you want to be blessed on your grocery or your net? <laughs> what is your relationship with your money? And it is critical in that. Our idea of our relationship with money needs to turn itself on its head. We need to have a sense. We give because we need to give. I need to release this money and this stuff. And when, when it says, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing, I interpret that as meaning don't be so careful in your accounting that you say, oh, well, you know, there's that need, but we, you know, we can't really give to that because we've already given our 10% this month. This is not an accounting question. It's a spiritual question. It's a compassion question. It is how can I be more like Jesus question. Did Jesus get to a point where he said, well, I think I've done enough of those people. I give my 10%, that's it. <coughs> I think he gave us everything. And if we're going to be more like him, what is our relationship to the things we have to give? Okay. This is a spiritual question. No one can serve two masters, either hate one and love the other, be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and man. Your relationship with your money affects your relationship with your God. Okay, that's the last of the slides. Um, there's a great story, and I'm going to close, I'm going to finish with this, which to me epitomizes what ought to be our relationship with our money. Earl Palmer, our pastor in, when we were in Seattle, he married Carolyn and I. Um, he was the speaker, the Hansons aren't here today, he was the speaker on the cruise we took, the, the trip from Turkey and then the cruise to, um, to some of the islands, visiting the seven churches of, of Revelation, six of the seven churches of Revelation. Anyway, uh, so they got to know Earl a little bit and heard him speak, and they know why we're kind of, when we talk about him, you know, it's like, I'm not worthy. <laughs> uh, Earl had been my pastor for so many years. Earl said that when he was young, still a young minister, that actually he was serving at Union Church in Manila, the Philippines. Um, he had a sabbatical coming, and they made arrangements to travel around the world. And they were traveling cheap. It was uh, he and his wife, and at that time they had two small kids. And they were going to travel around the world because they'd gotten discounted, like missionary fare kind of thing, wrapped in fares. And they were going to be staying at guest houses and churches and in people's homes. And so it wasn't going to be, it sounds, around the world sounds like a big deal. Well, he said, we didn't have a lot of money. And so they had some friends who came up to them before the trip. And they said, Earl, Shirley, Here's a hundred dollars, and we want you to just take this and think of it as mad money. And wherever you go, whenever you have an opportunity or a desire, you see something you want to buy, or you want to go out to a nice dinner, whatever you want to do, this is just for you. This is just to have fun with. Earl tells a story. They took that hundred dollars and they left Manila and they came to their first place and they were, you know, visiting church and everything. And, and there was a, a need at a church, you know, something they really needed to provide for this this mission church. And one of the kids said, Dad, we could give them that $100. <laughs> and Earl said, that's a great idea. So they gave them the $100 to meet the need in this church. Well, they spent time there, and they went to the next place, and they got some place, and there was a family that was in real need right then in the church. <laughs> and the other kid said, Mom, we could give them that $100. <laughs> and Shirley said, that's a great idea. And they gave them the $100. <laughs> Earl said that on that trip, they made around the world visiting churches and fellow Christians and staying in their homes and everything else, that they probably spent that hundred dollars a dozen, fifteen, twenty times. And they didn't ever say, oh, we've already spent that. Their left hand didn't know what their right hand was doing, even though it really did. And as Earl told the story, he said that we got blessed by that hundred dollars over and over and over they had spent it once on a nice meal or a knick-knack or whatever, they'd been gone. But because their heart was such that when the opportunity to, to serve by giving, when a need was there, when an opportunity was there, 
They gave it to them again and again and again. And I, I absolutely believe this was a loaves and fishes kind of thing. That every time they gave it, God filled it back. You know, they gave out of their purse, God filled it back up again. And they gave out of their purse and God filled it back up again. And if you, if you ever get to know Earl and Shirley, you can understand that. Um, that's what our relationship should be with our money. They were young, not okay, <coughs> taking the trip of a lifetime, young kids. But every chance they got, they gave away $100. Same $100 every time. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions or comments about service or about... Uh, well, we have to be good stewards of our money. Well, you know what? We do have to be good stewards of our money. You know, and they didn't impoverish their children by giving away that hundred dollars. No, you know. but I mean, you say we, you know, how much we think of the stock market or whatever like this. Yeah. If 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 we're depending on the stock market for our, our well, yeah. What I said actually was, if you pay more attention to the stock market than you do the things of God, then that might be a symptom that you have a wrong relationship. That doesn't mean going to the stock market. That don't mean doesn't mean be wise in your investments. You know what, if you're wise in your investments, then you might have more money you can give away. And that's a great thing. So be good stewards of the things. You know, don't waste the things of God. In fact, the story of the talents, you remember that God, or the, the, I'm sorry, not God, the, the wealthy landowner, the wealthy or the rich man, called in his three servants. And the first servant he gave, you know, he gave a talent to, and the second servant he gave a talent, and he said, okay, you know, you guys work with this while I'm gone. And he came back, and the first servant had invested it and had ten talents. Second servant had invested and got five talents. And the third servant said, I know that you are a hard man, that you are a man who reaps where he does not sow. That, you know, and so I was scared that if I lost this, I'd be in trouble. So I just wrapped it up and buried it. Here it is back. And he said, you foolish servant. And he gave the first, he said, your talent, take your talent and give it to the man who made ten talents for him. And the, ta the man who made ten talents was given much responsibility. The man who made five talents was given... Oh, still a lot of responsibility, and one, the one talent is given none. So that story is about being a good, a good, smart steward with the resources God has given us. But the question then is, why am I doing it? If I'm doing it just for me, just for me. I mean, I know people down here with economic difficulties in you know in, in the U.S. and health, and that's affected everybody. They spend all of their time worrying about whether they're going to be okay financially. And to them, being okay financially means having a lot of money left. Okay, Some of the people I know, that's the case. And that gets back to that question of, you, we can't be people of faith and people of fear at the same time. If we believe God is in charge, and He's in charge of our money too, if we don't believe God's in charge of our money and we worry about it all the time, that's exactly what we're saying. That means we have a wrong relationship with our money. Okay, Still be smart. God doesn't like stupid servants. He wants us to be smart, wise, invest well. But don't, don't forget that it's not yours. Richard. I find that as I give, it helps me get rid of some of my greediness. Yeah, exactly. And that's it. Well, our relationship with our money, when we give, that's the only antidote. When we are generous with our money, it's the only antidote for the wrong relationship. That's, that's the discipline of it. You grow spiritually when you give it away. And miraculously, when you give it away, God gives it back to you. He fills the purse up again. Carolyn and I will attest to the fact we've done stuff that I'm sure financial managers <coughs> would say, you know, that's really not very smart. You're giving away part of your retirement or whatever. And Carolyn has a saying. She said, how many times can I win the lottery? Yeah, and I don't, thing. not literally the lottery. You know, she said I can never, oh. I can never win the lottery because I, I couldn't tell my mother about a ticket. <laughs> um, but you know, by winning the lottery, it's just unforeseen blessings, unforeseen gifts. Okay. Um, and I believe that that's very true. And it's not because we're cool. It's because God has allowed us to learn that lesson. Right? Okay, God bless you all.